I'm David Harmon with Remax. I'm with my partner, Keith Cook, and we have Heidi Kinnerson with People's Bank with us today, going over the home mortgage process um, and what it takes to have a successful mortgage application. Okay, so how or when do you start the loan process? So typically the best time to start the loan process is before you start house hunting. And the reason for that is it gives you time to fully understand all of your different loan options, go through the process of pre-approval, and then be in an immediate position to make an offer in the home. And that's really key because your loan needs are gonna change depending on the type of home you find. You may find a home that's turnkey or one that needs a little minor upgrade. And so going through the process in advance is gonna give you time to go over the different loan options as well as be educated on the best way to structure your offer with your agent to benefit you. Well, and if you start early too, it seems like if you run into a blip or something on your credit or you need to get um, extra paperwork for getting your overtime or something, the more time you have, I mean, have you had some success stories where someone started and it took a little longer to, to get the home? Oh, absolutely. A lot of times you start with that initial application, but maybe you have a few hurdles or a few different unique employment and income situation. And so by applying in advance, it gives the lender an option to really reach out to your employer, get some clarification, and that can often lead to you applying or being approved for more, a higher purchase price, because you're able to use that higher income. And I can absolutely full-heartedly say this as <laughs> far as we were talking a little earlier about the research ahead of time. So I know, I don't know of any loan officer that does a better job than you for looking at the information ahead of time. And so whether that's the buyer or the property, because there's been often times when we're calling with even an approved property or looking at a property and you're like, oh, what about this or that? Because you've gone on to research the property. So where I can see just from that end, what you do on researching a property up front, let alone what you're doing with the buyer. So starting with Heidi up front, the benefit is that you will know all of your ducks are in a row. And if you feel that you're qualified to go out looking, I don't know of anyone better than to go out with a pre-qual from you because you know you've crossed everything off and we're ready to go. And the downfall of someone not doing that is that you may start down the road with an online lender or something, think you're pre-qualified, spend money on an appraisal and an inspection only to find out that the loan officer didn't do their homework up front and that potentially could put you in a uh, position to lose the home and all the money and time you spent on it. So uh, I, I think you're golden as far as how that works with people um, if they're starting off the process with you. So I think that does make sense. So starting it off a little bit sooner is what we like to see because we anticipate that there will be some hurdles. And so let's just nip them in the bud and get rolling at them right off the bat. Absolutely. So what is the loan process? It's really quite simple. It comes down to five main steps, which is submitting an application. And that can be done by phone, in person, or online. It takes about 20 minutes. The lender will then pull a credit report. And the third step is they will go ahead and ask you for some supporting paperwork, such as a pay stub, W-2, and a bank statement, which will show the down payment funds. The next step is they'll go through a process of looking at all of the different loans you qualify for and then submitting it through an underwriting process, which depending on the loan amount can take as little as an hour or up to a few days. Once that process is complete, you're pre-approved and they provide you a pre-approval letter so that you can go ahead and start making offers on homes. And that letter is valid for four months of house hunting. But so which point do you like take blood? <laughs> <laughs> that's not part of your process. And there used to be back in the easy money, didn't you have to fog a mirror or something oh, that's at about one it. point too? So. <laughs> but it's pretty simple. I mean, it's not as hard as what you think. So no. if you're going to get a car or a credit card or anything like that. So you, you've been around the block on a few of these sales. So you know what to expect. So that's the process. It's that simple. So I think some people are intimidated just thinking, oh, I'm going to own a house or real estate. But it's actually pretty easy. I think you make it easy with the process of going through that. So it's uh, how much does it cost to try to go through this process? There is no fee or obligation. So you can go out and get a qualified or approved for free. So, you know, why not? And even if you think that, ah, I got terrible credit or some of this is going to happen, falling back on that, meet with Heidi now with the idea, maybe you're buying a home in a year, but let's just touch base right now because there's some stuff you could be doing to fix your 
I'm just going to keep on saying credit, but fix any blemishes you may have on your on your purchase. So and you're not getting fired and all that yeah. happy stuff too. But so no, that's good. No, that's super easy process. So Heidi, what is the percentage of income somebody should spend on their housing? You know, that's a good question. And honestly, it's going to depend on each individual, their comfort zone, as well as what their financial goals are. Some buyers will spend a lot more on their house payment because they find the forever home the first time. Other buyers, buyers will spend less because they have other goals. They want to save for retirement or they want to work part time so that they can travel or spend time with family or just invest in other things. But generally speaking, most lenders will allow you to spend up to 49% of your gross monthly income on your mortgage payment, your car payment, credit cards, student loans, alimony, child support, and things like that. And if you're watching this, I wouldn't say necessarily to go all the way to the max of what right. you qualify for as well, because there's some of the things, even if it is your forever home or, or how fancy it is, you're potentially looking at more maintenance, maybe more dues, maybe more taxes, maybe more on insurance. So some of these other items can go up as well. And also if you were to say had a $200,000 less in a house, well, that's 200,000 working for you in another investment. So there is somewhat of an opportunity cost in being in a nice home because you know, you could either be in one super nice home or say you had two mediocre homes and you lived in one and rented the other one out and had all that coming in too. So that's later down the road, but just saying it is something to think about making sure where people are at. So some people are going to go full tilt all the way to the max, 49%. They're pushing for 59%, but <laughs> they're going for it. So good information to know. So 49% is total what uh, you would have for your house and your, your, uh, Payment. So how is that divided down house versus expenses? So if I have no credit cards, no house, you know, no other payments, then um, what's the percentage allotted towards the house? If you have no other debt, it's 49%. And But like you said, a lot of buyers aren't going to go to that level. They want to have a respective house payment that they're comfortable with so that they can do a lot of other things. Um, but the reason that generally most lenders will let you go up to 49% is it leaves 51% of your gross income for other everyday expenses, such as clothing and travel and utilities and things like that. And so that's where each home buyer is gonna make that own personal choice on what their comfort zone is. So should I like buy a new car right before <laughs> I come talk to you? Or what does that throw into the equation? Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because if you buy a new car, every $25 of that car payment actually drops your buying power of $5,000. Wow. So it, it just wait on the car, buy the house first. <laughs> And I, I think the, the car guys will absolutely get you into <laughs> a car later. So it's a little, yes. a little easier to qualify for a car versus a house. Exactly. So how much upfront money do I need for a loan? You know, most lenders will provide you 100% financing. So zero down payment for their first time home buyers. That sounds expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you know, that includes home buyers that just haven't owned a home in the last three years. There are some income limitations that may apply. But even if you're getting 100% financing, there are some closing costs and then some prorations for property taxes and insurance. So it's best if you can set aside three to $5,000 if possible for your home purchase. Now, there are additional options for home buyers and often a lower interest rate if you can put three to six, three to 20% down. Three to 5,000 closing costs and then three to 20% down for the down payment. Yes. So do they have to have that money themselves? Can they be gifted it? Maybe their family member gives them the money for the closing costs? Gifts are absolutely an option. Do you gift them money? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> How does the gift work? Yeah, so when you're getting a gift, there's a few different options and depending on the loan program, there can be some documentation that you're required to provide. But typically the simplest option is to have them wire the funds to the title company that's handling your closing. And then all that's needed is a signed gift letter. So it keeps it really simple. And that's documented, it's like a family member, Any, is, anyone can give you a gift? So typically there are some restrictions on who is eligible to give you a gift. Um, so check with your lender first before receiving the gift right. and they can help walk you through that. And I'm available for gifts. So if anyone <laughs> has any money that they want to gift around, but I think usually what we'll see this in real estate, it's usually, I would say, younger uh, buyers because they may not have the money and the older people want to see and understand and appreciate real estate ownership. So if you need some money down, it's actually 
realistically better, say, for your parents to gift your kids money because you're setting your kids off on the right path. So the better off your kids are in life, the better chance you have of them taking care of you when you're older. <laughs> so help them out now. And that's it's uh, just it's money in the right direction. Yeah. So what uh, closing costs are the sellers paying? So typically in Washington state, the sellers are going to pay the real estate commission unless in the purchase and sale contract that's assigned to another party. They're going to pay excise tax to Whatcom County, an owner's title policy, and half the escrow fee. And so that's going to be in every transaction. So if we have a, a, a cash buyer, they're going to pay. The sellers are going to have those every time. Absolutely. But it's also possible because I've seen it sometimes on asking for closing costs. So sometimes I've seen it. So the seller have their normal closing costs, but a buyer, say if they needed three to 5000 down and say they only had... 2000 down. Sometimes I've seen those where the buyer may ask the seller to pay a couple thousand towards closing costs. Absolutely. How does that work? Well, and that's what's really nice about going through that pre-approval process because it's going to allow you to know what you're looking at from a figure standpoint. And if you need a little assistance with getting to that number of cash you're going to need at closing, your realtor can go ahead and structure that as part of your offer so that the seller can assist in contributing towards your closing costs and reduce the cash that you have to come to the table with. So Heidi, how long have you been at, at uh, People's Bank? I've been at People's Bank for eight years, and I've been in home lending for 20 years. Before that, you're actually here in our building yes. where I think we first started doing transactions together. So I think the the, the benefit, again, is your local, at least you're local to people in Whatcom County, and I'd imagine you do Skagit and other parts of the, of the state as well. Are you only Washington? Right. We only lend in Washington State. And the, the benefit, I would say, if you're looking for Washington is just everything that you have was with peoples and and what how I will describe some lenders as I use my hamburger analogy that you can go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac but you can't go anywhere else and get the Big Mac and so you can't get that at Burger King or Dairy Queen and I think peoples has a lot of programs like that you've got different Big Macs if I can say Big Mac but you've got different Big Mac programs that you have there too and it's cool with the the 20 years of experience just knowing how to put everything together. And I'm not sure, I guess side question, because even rolling back in my mind on why you really pre-qualify everyone up front. And what I've seen sometimes, because when we, we send out usually three different lenders, so you're one of our favorite three, and with talking with some people, it seems like maybe it's a little easier with the other people, but I've seen that, or someone finds someone online, it was like, oh, I'm gonna go online because it's easy. And in talking with you about it, it was like, well, did they know about this or this or that? And I think the the some borrowers get in the idea, well, huh, they didn't ask me. I'm not going to have to provide that. Well, you see what's going to happen down the, the forecast and know what's going to happen and, and ask for it up front versus these other people are running around and potentially jeopardy of losing their deals because they didn't do the work up front. So I think if you're going to borrow some money, you might as well borrow some money from someone who has the experience. So we'll cap it at 20, even if it's more than 20, we'll just say, because you, you're, you're, you know, we're only at 30, right? So that's a, a plus. So a quick question, Heidi. So we, we always like our, our buyers or what to use local lenders. Um, what, what do you think the advantages are using a local lender over maybe a national lender? Yeah, really it comes down to customer service and then local reputation. So when you make an offer on a home, part of what that seller is going to look at is who you've used as a lender. Then if you use someone local, they're going to know that local lender's reputation. Does that lender have a history and a reputation for completing purchases successfully and on time? Does that lender have a reputation for being diligent in that approval process to make sure that that seller can be fully confident that your financing is rock solid? And that reputation of your lender can play into how the seller compares your offer in comparison to someone else that's making an additional offer. So a few other things about local lenders is when you go through the loan process, there is actually a loan team. There's lots of different parties that do work on your loan to get you to the finish line. And local lenders, their loan team sits right in the county, the state, in the same time zone that you do. And that doesn't sound important, but in real estate, your purchase and sale contract has some deadlines and so does your loan that are time sensitive. So having that all be in the same time zone is very important. 
Um, another thing is local lenders use local appraisers that live and work in the area. And so when they're valuing your home, they have local community knowledge of the different areas that they're valuing. And lastly, local lenders often give you the option to retain your servicing instead of have your loan sold after closing. And that can pay, play a role in it because what that means if they keep your servicing is that you're gonna make your payments to that lender for the whole life of your loan. Whereas if they sell your servicing, after you get keys to the home, you're making your payments to someone else. So it's nice to have those options and understand the differences. Yeah, definitely, definitely a big benefit then. Yeah. Oh, huge. And I'd say if you're gonna rewind any part of this so far, it would be that part because I think some people go online and say interest rates and somehow you go down this rabbit hole and all of a sudden you made application, you didn't realize it and it seems like it's gonna go okay. Personally, what I can say is I absolutely agree with, with everything you just said right there. And if we're in a multiple offer situation, we as brokers, and maybe not so much the sellers because they're looking at a lot of other things, but if your broker's looking after you, they should be looking at who's written the uh, pre-approval letter and, and seeing if it comes from from you, from Peoples, I think that's gonna put it a step above a lot of other, other situations. And with being local, you've worked with a lot of the brokers. There's a thousand brokers or so in our county, so you've had a chance to work with them and they don't think you're a slug. So <laughs> they're gonna know, oh, if Heidi's on it, they're gonna have the same relationship that we do. It's like, all right, here's someone that gets the job done. So that does help a lot. So, I mean, if you were looking at getting a loan, it doesn't cost anything to talk and see what kind of Big Macs she has, you know, for <laughs> what her programs are. They're pretty good. So, <laughs> so I, would, uh, I would definitely go that way versus the other thing with the online people, if you haven't seen the whites of their eyes, I mean, it's hard to say how do they really have a, compassion or a feeling for you. And it's it's frustrating when I see it, mostly online lenders, they don't care about the time frame. So we could say the closing's on the 15th. Well, guess what? The seller doesn't have to extend till the 16th. They don't have to. If you can't close on the 15th, the deal's off. And so some of the times these lenders are, oh, just get an extension, ask for more time. That's asking. Someone may not have to give the extension. And I've been in a situation before where, okay, close on the 15th. Buyer couldn't close, they wanted to go on the 17th. The seller said no and switched gears and went with a different buyer. So the buyer lost the house, all the energy they put into it, the appraisal, the inspection, everything else because the buyer made a poor decision on who he was gonna get the loan with. So can say that's not gonna happen if you go uh, your route. So way better than going with the online brokers. Sorry online people, but the, <laughs> it's just way better to go local. So what are the different types of home loans? So there's a lot of different home loans. There's a first mortgage, there's a second mortgage, there's a home equity line of credit, uh, USDA, FHA, conventional, jumbo, home style renovation, construction, uh, reverse mortgage, which People's Bank doesn't currently offer, and then bridge loan financing and land loan financing. So lots of options. Wow. And VA. And VA. There you go. Yes. I was keeping track. <laughs> How about rehab loans? We do do. We call okay. ours renovation. Okay. And that's what's really nice is it's a way for you to finance and repairs at the time of purchase. So we do offer those. So these are all hamburgers. And then you still have the sub 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 hamburgers below that. So right. it's looking at all of these ones. So all of these make sense. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of all the different types of loans here. But they're, you know, the first is, you know, like your first house, the HELOC or the second's huge. Um, I think everyone should have a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit. So you kind of go through the process and you're set up to borrow money like any time down the road. Mm -hmm. So in case you run into an emergency and you need a quick 50000 or 10000 or whatever, and you don't want to go through the whole process, you don't have it, you need the money. Well, if you put your ducks in a row, you can actually have the ability to borrow money on your signature at any time down the road mm -hmm. because you have gone through the process. And so... Let's just say you have a $100,000 line or a $50,000 line. You've put the work in ahead of time and maybe you don't even touch it for a year. And then next year you need to go dip into that for a little bit. So you go take 5,000 out, go spend it, whatever you've done, you've replaced. Now you can put it back in there and your payments are back to zero. Correct. I like that versus a second also because it, when the balance is at zero, your payments at zero, your interest is at zero. So it, it kind of goes up and down when you need it. So instead of like if someone needed 20 grand wanted to go cash advance a credit card and look yeah. at what that would cost us that would be crazy so you guys have just open a conversation and i think some of this stuff too is where um with interest rates fluctuating and things like that where i'm sure you've talked to people where 
they've met with you, you've helped them with the house, five years later, they're like, what are the rates like? Or maybe get in a second, or we wanna do an addition or do something like that. So I think your kind of relationship building, not just the one time with a loan, because a lot of times that's people's biggest asset and they wanna tap into it for borrowing money down the road or liquidating. So lots of different loans you have. So that's really cool. It's not just like, we just have no cheese, no <laughs> lettuce. You guys have everything. It's a smorgasbord of hamburgers there. Yeah, that's a huge list of things that you that you guys offer. And I think that going back to the uh, the local aspect of this whole thing, if you want an advocate and you just want a home loan, you could get that broad question answered by somebody. But if you want like an advocate, somebody that's a professional that can actually look at your situation and give advice on what actually piece of the puzzle is going to work best for you. Somebody like Heidi is like the, the, the prime example of somebody that's going to be your advocate and help you along. Well, thanks. So what percentage do you guys uh, sell off versus you guys service yourself for Red Peoples? You know, honestly, I think that we sell off probably about 30%, okay. if I had to guess at that. I mean, ultimately, the choices are buyers, though. We don't force them into one choice or the other. And there's many different reasons that people would choose staying at People's Bank or having the loan sold later. So it's nice because it, that decision is fully up to the buyer. And, and with all these options, because you guys have checking accounts and savings account and physical locations too. So having a bank account, working with someone. So you're one entity of the of the bank, but you guys also have all of these other services, safety deposit boxes and all that stuff. So, and you're big in the community with uh, community spirit and everything that you guys do with Ski to Sea and all that stuff too. Oh, yeah. So pretty cool that way, but it is a different, so online, bankers that you're not going to get a checking account with them or go deposit your check or you know go break a 20 for you you guys can go get a roll of nickels or whatever you want they're right here in bellingham so well and the other great thing about people's bank is that we are a full service bank and so that includes commercial lending if you find a commercial building that you want to purchase we've got loans for that too is there anything you guys don't do is that easier maybe that, would that have might be shorter, easier shorter <laughs> so yeah one question we like to qualify our buyers with is the fact that you know we're not responsible for whether or not they paid their bond marche bill or their macy's bill or their jc penny card um, so how how does bad credit and and how can somebody improve that credit score yeah, we get that question a lot. And really, for a lot of home buyers, it's scary to put yourself out there to apply for a home loan. But the great thing is for home loans, perfection with credit is not required. And most lenders have uh, programs that allow for lower credit scores, collections, or bankruptcies and things like that. So the most important thing is to submit your application. And that way you know where you stand. And the loan officer, if they can't fit you in the box that day, they can give you steps and tools so that you can qualify as soon as possible for home financing. Um, what we often find when it comes to people that have less than perfect credit is they had something happen in their life and it was really bad. And because of that, they just stopped using credit altogether. And so what that does is it freezes them in time where they don't have any new credit to tell the story of who they are today. And so often with those buyers, the best thing they can do is apply for new credit, owe less than 25% of the credit limit, and make on-time payments for three to six months. And what that does is that gives them some new credit to show who they are today and push back that old credit that was negative into the past. And when they do that, we often see that their credit score rises. Uh, but each situation is unique, and that's why it's important to apply for a home loan so that that lender can give you advice based on your specific situation on how to build credit. That's why I would think with us, with our younger clients or people who may have had more credit history or challenges, like start them right now. So if yeah. it's like I've talked to you know, people and they have their kids, where do we start? The first thing is you don't go start with us because sometimes people do start with the loan officer or do you start with the brokers? Well, Dave and I don't know what you're gonna qualify for if you just come and sit at our office or meet us at an open house or go look. So how do we know what your price range is? So that's where we would start them off with you. And for the most part, I think realistically, everyone's gonna qualify for a loan. Everyone, you've heard it right here, everyone's gonna qualify for a loan but there's some what ifs and some ands and there's some things you may have to fix for it. But if you want a home, you can do it, but yeah, you gotta pay off all of that back debt and those judgments, but you can get a home after that. Or you have to make more money. If you wanna get a house, you have to have a job or you have to have you know, better credit or you need some down payment money, but it can happen. So it, it sounds funny to say that, but 
realistically, if you gave me any scenario, I'm sure you could MacGyver away. It may take <laughs> a year or two, but really any scenario is fixable. So to think, oh, I can't do it. It's like burying your head in the sand. I can't do it. Well, it can happen. So it's, it's uh, I think looking with that attitude, it may not happen today. You might be able to buy a house today, but you might be able to dig yourself out of that hole in six months or a year or two years or see what it happens. And then it, when you were saying it, it brought up because we went through what you went through as well as like the short sales and foreclosures and tricky loans that way. So how is it affecting you right now? So if, if I'm to purchase and I did a foreclosure, a short sale or foreclosure 10 years ago, how is that, how are you looking at that now? I know it's case by case, but. Yeah, it really comes down to the circumstances surrounding that situation. Uh, what happened and who, and well, what happened and the timing of it. Let so me preface type this. Of so, loan. so a short sale or a foreclosure is when someone owned a house a long time ago or recently and then lost it back to the bank one way. So a foreclosure, stop making payments. The people, the uppers at the bank will actually come and they'll, they'll take that house back. You can't just skip payments. The short sale is um, sometimes the, the homeowner was trying to sell the house, but they're just not gonna get enough money to pay the loan off. And the nice people at the bank would say, all right, we'll accept less and, and, and release you from um, from the property. And sometimes there's strings attached or not, but so th that's what it is. So here it is say someone not you guys these online lenders took my house <laughs> um 10 years ago and now i want to buy a house now so i've got a bigger ding than i missed my jc penny bill so how do you deal with the big dings well the really nice thing is is that again perfection's not required so there are waiting periods that you have to meet and we don't see a lot of the foreclosures in the short sales as we used to because mm -hmm. a lot of that was like you said, 10 years ago or in the past. But that's what's great is that there's typically just some waiting periods that have to be met. And then you're good to go. So, so those guys just forget. Oh, they don't even look <laughs> over there. So that's right. kind of nice. So if that there's a lot of people in that situation. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that happen with. So say pick if you thought you couldn't get home ownership up again, it sounds like you heard it right here. Heidi's got some cash for you. So. <laughs> Yeah, on that same note, that, I mean, some some people go through hard times and they have to file bankruptcy. How does that affect their home financing? Yeah. yeah, honestly, same thing with bankruptcy. There's typically a one to four year waiting period, depending on from the time it's been dismissed or discharged and depending on the type of bankruptcy filed and what ha was happening, the circumstances with it. So the best thing to do is apply with your lender and have them take a look at your specific situation and that way they can give you the steps that you can take to get the best loan terms when your waiting period's over. Will some of that uh, affect your interest rate too or is that either it's an all or nothing or is it something sometimes based on credit your credit's a little marginal, so we'll still give you the money, but we're gonna pay you, you know, you need to pay a little bit more. Interestingly enough, with the bankruptcy itself won't impact your interest rate. Really, interest rates are set based on down payment amount as well as what your credit score is. So if the bankruptcy is bringing your credit score down a little bit, then that will adjust the rate, but not the bankruptcy itself. If someone's out there right now, they're thinking about uh, getting a house, is there any tips or planning they might think about? So typically when you're thinking about getting a, a house, there's a few things that you would not want to do. <laughs> um, the first thing when you go through your pre-approval process, your lender will probably give you some of these do's and don'ts, but it's good to remember that you don't want to open or close bank accounts or make transfers between bank accounts without talking to your lender first about the documents that will be required. You also don't want to change your jobs or your employer without talking to your lender about how that may impact your qualifications. You don't want to make any major purchases such as furniture, car, or appliances without talking to your lender first. Jewelry. No. <laughs> um, you also don't want to increase the balances on your current credit cards because that's going to bring payments up or apply for any new credit because that can also impact your qualifying for the loan. And then you'd brought up gift funds before. If you're going to get gift funds, that's great, but don't forget to tell your lender that that's gonna be part of your down payment because there's going to be some paperwork that's needed and there also gift funds are only eligible if certain conditions are met. So talk to your lender about that. So it's kind of the most <laughs> rules we've heard from you so far. So if you do all of that, touch base with you and don't buy anything and pay your stuff off. But so you have to be good for what? A couple months? Is that it? <laughs> just from the time that you're going to find the house, just 
don't do all that stuff. So it's not forever. Once you close, so boom, we got the house, boom, <laughs> we got the house. And um, so right after closing, then I can get the jewelry, then I can get the car, then I can get the furniture because it's funded, it's my house, and it doesn't matter. You guys are kind of out of our hair. So as much as you were analyzing me all the way up until I got the house, once I own it, you guys really don't care anymore. We so don't care. Free as a bird. Yep. So do you have people that didn't take your advice or say these online people that you've heard of at seminars that have have found the dream home and uh, made a couple boo-boos along the way while they're in contract? I did. I had a buyer who right before closing uh, purchased a new car and it had an $800 a month payment and that didn't work for the loan. Whoa. Thankfully, we were successful in completing the loan purchase because the buyer had a source of income that they had not listed previously on the application. And so using that income, it helped offset that new $800 mortgage payment. But had they not had that source of income, the loan would have been denied and they would have lost out on the house. How did they not come up with their extra <laughs> income? I'm just like, that was, it's almost like back with, because right now all the loans are documented loans. Yeah. And so back in the day with these non-documented loans to where you could actually just say like, okay, I work at a convenience store and I make, you know, 600 bucks an hour. And you're like, all right, <laughs> convenience store, 600 bucks an hour. And it, I mean, that may be exaggerating a bit, but it really wasn't checked as much. So yeah. right now, which I think that was a problem when we went through a big problem. So I think for the most part, the loans I see are logical and they make sense. So um with some of these uh those horror stories that is that is sad when that happens because everyone's comes up and, and they want to get the property and so i've seen them not necessarily from the loan side but there are some sad stories in real estate but uh hopefully the guy got a nice car out of it, it sounds like you got him the house so <laughs> yeah i guess my takeaway on that is is really i guess when you are, are thinking about buying a house instead of going to an open house and finding the perfect house and then like oh i'm going to call heidi and get approved for a loan it might be advantageous to meet with you in advance, whether that's maybe 12 months or six months or three months. In case you have those questions, maybe you had a bankruptcy, maybe you're self-employed, maybe you had bad credit or whatever. It's Maybe it's it's good to hire a coach or somebody like Heidi that, right. can, that can walk you through the steps um, so you're ready when you see that house to buy it and it's not catching you. Well, that's the biggest lesson that I have learned is getting pre-approved before you start house hunting is just going to give you the lowest amount of stress and the highest amount of success when you're home buying. Because that way, before you fall in love, you've gone through the process, you've gotten past any speed bumps that might be there, and you fully understand your loan options and have that approval letter so that you can make an immediate offer and don't lose out on that opportunity. One way or the other, obviously we're leaning more your direction, but at least starting the process with anyone. So yes. any loan officer, cause you only, you know, service so big of an area. So get that process started. I would say universally this works across the United States. It will work for, for everyone who wants to get into home ownership or it, it somewhat makes sense just like meeting with you down the road. It's like, all right, I'm paying 12% interest. Can you hook a brother up? Or you're like, <laughs> all right, yeah, or I need some money. Or, I want to do stuff. Or it's like, I think a little bit financial planning because you can say, well, you don't owe much here. And if you're looking at investments or things like that. So again, I know it's a beating a drum here, but that's why like, I think you give solid advice and you preload the people that you're working with, with information for a successful outcome without surprises. So I think there's some people, you know, it's a pain in the butt sometimes when you want a letter for this and a letter for that. So, but it's just a process and it's just a piece of paper. It's all doable. So, you know, well, sometimes you have to write a letter. Um, why did I miss that JC Penny bill? Well, my dog ate the bill or whatever. But <laughs> the process where I would see if, if you ask for something, you want it. And it's not like, well, maybe if you get around to it, um, I might want it. But all lenders are going to want a lot of the same type of things. What I see with you, you let people know up front. So you're very transparent to let people know what you're going to anticipate with that person up front versus these other lenders, those bad online lenders. They don't ask for that stuff up until it's later. And that's what puts you in jeopardy. So Heidi, a lot of people that we uh, deal with and, ha and have questions on the home loan process, their concern is if I do apply for a loan, is it going to hurt my credit score? 
So that's a really good question. And honestly, the answer you're going to get is going to be totally different depending on who you talk to and what Google says. But <laughs> generally speaking, you can typically apply at three different places and have your credit pulled three different times without it having an impact to your credit score on the mortgage side. It's typically after that, if you have more and more credit pulled, that you're going to see your, your credit score climb down for a little bit. Right. And so, like, what's the highest credit you've seen with no names? Oh, boy. It, probably not me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I've seen an 850. Wow. And so, yeah, it's pretty high. Yeah. What's the lowest? I've seen a 520, I think. But honestly, I mean, like I said, those lenders have options for all sorts of home buyers. Wow. So it's Eight. best to apply and see where you're at. So do you have a strategy of, like, paying, uh, like, having three credit cards versus six or having one credit card jacked up and then the other ones at no balance or is there any type of things like any little tricks to get my credit score up there? Honestly, that's interesting because the credit companies, the minute that we figure out their tricks, they change <laughs> the rules on us and then there's new tricks. Right. But generally speaking right now, the best way to go, it really doesn't matter how much credit available you have, mm -hmm. it's more what are your balances? Are your balances less than 25 or 40 percent of your credit limit? That's kind of the sweet spot for having that. Would that be per card? So if I had three cards, they're all 10,000. Instead of owing 10,000 on one, owe two grand on each, and then that might appear better. That might appear better. Old school yeah. until they Google it and figure it out. <laughs> but, That's funny. But I think people are working on that because sometimes if you're the the more diligent you are on your credit, somewhat you're going to save a little bit of payment down the road. So it might cost a little bit more either in upfront fees or interest if you have, you know, the guy at 850 should be rewarded versus the guy at 520. And that's still cool. He got the house, but if you got 850, that that's in her, I, I, that's that's wild. I mean, a lot of times I hear is what's like golden. Is there like a, a slotting with this? Because 800 I think is considered really outstanding too. Right. So is there um, uh, break points where it's going to put you into different types of loans? Yeah, typically from lender to lender, you're going to see a difference in interest rate in tiers. Um, typically, the top tier is more 740. That's going to give you that best pricing and what most lenders will quote rates on. Um, and then it goes down to 720, 700. It goes in about 20 point increments. And so you'll see a little bit of different variation in interest rates as those credit scores change. Well, and, and, and credit is nice, so it definitely makes the world go round. So mm -hmm. why not take care of it? You're going to have to pay the bills anyways and and avoid late fees and extra interest rates and and so yep use it wisely also a quick question what are your thoughts on credit repair companies that guys i've watched late night tv and i see these guys on there all the time saying that you can i mean should i call you first or should i call the credit repair people Honestly, typically it's nice to get a recommendation from both parties because what a lender might be looking at for a home loan might be different than what a lender is looking at for a car loan or for a credit card. And so you want to make sure that you're working with the lender that's going to be providing you the loan to give you an education on what they're looking for and then reach out to the credit repair companies and see what they might recommend to get there and compare that with what the lender has recommended. And with credit, one thing I've talked to people when they call us, if they have the credit, so if they're going to talk to three people and they have a, a rough idea of what their credit score is, it doesn't mean you have to pull their credit just because you're calling them. They're like, Johnny on the spot to call the credit. I think if you someone made to say, all right, I have a, a 720 credit and you're going to be able to base the information on 720 and then in the process you will check that. I know you're not going to wait till way at the end, but yeah. it doesn't mean just because someone's talking to you that you're there to their credit. Well, and the nice thing is, as a consumer, you're allowed to get one free credit report for per year. And so if you're more interested in just, you don't want the lender to pull it, you just want to say, hey, here's what I'm seeing, that credit report might be slightly different than the one that the mortgage lender gets, but it's going to have the information and they can take a look at that. So you don't have to give have your credit pulled to have the lender help educate you on the different options. So kind of in wrapping it up right here, we will have, um, we're gonna put all your contact information below and email. So if someone wants to get the start of the process or just shoot you an email, what's the keyword cash or money? <laughs> Is there any secret handshake that you have to money. do? Or? Is there a 10% discount if you right. call today? Cheeseburger. <laughs> so anyways, that was fun. Hopefully if you are local, um, you know, I would definitely try uh, try giving Heidi a shot. And, and if you want to talk to a couple, that's fine, too. Like I said, we have, yeah. have other lenders, but I would absolutely, absolutely put her on the list for uh, what's there. 